Hardly a year passes without this serial entrepreneur starting something new. He co-creates, leads, nurtures, and helps fund global digital and technology startups in industries as diverse as travel, home furnishings, and robots for the kitchen. But many of us still know him best as the online pioneer who co-founded the legendary LastMinute.com. Please welcome co-founder and executive chairman, First Minute Capital founders, Factory Founders Forum, and more, Brent Hoberman. Thank you. Hey, Brent. Thank you. Hi, Lauren. <laughs> this is such a pleasure to see you again. And Lovely. thank you for being here. Because I think the last time you were at a Focus Right conference was in 2006. I believe you. <laughs> thank okay. you. It's great to be back. Yeah. And at that time, you had just sold to Sabre. Mm-hmm. Okay. Great. <laughs> that was great. That was fun. Ah, oh, yeah. There were other options. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we can get that back looking at yeah. um, the past, but, but one of the, I think, when I think of you and I think of what you represented for the industry at the time, because we, Focus Rider kind of started in, we started in 1998 with research and covering the marketplace. Yeah. So when you guys came along, you kind of personified like, all the energy, all the youth, all the optimism that came into e-commerce and travel e-commerce at the time. And you know that. You, you and Martha Lane Fox, you were darlings of the industry. We, we, you know, we, we had fun. We were bold. We, were, we didn't know enough. So I think that idea of when you start something you don't know too much, you can be truly innovative. Um, and I think that was some of the excitement is being absolute outsiders to an industry was the sort of joy and the fact that this was the moment or another moment for the internet. But what was sort of very special about that time, as people remember, is we were convincing people in 1998, same as when you started, that the internet was going to happen. And that's what seems so strange now, is people, how hard it is so often for people who know too much to see and understand the future. So it's interesting, as I was going to ask you what you saw at the time, but to your point, it's what you really didn't see that you were so intrigued with. Mm. Look, I think we saw a pattern, of, you know, I was a strategy consultant way back then looking at media and e-commerce models and stuff. Not e it was actually pre-e-commerce, TV commerce maybe. Mm -hmm. And it didn't take a rocket science when you started to analyze those business plans and models to say, this is just a better way of doing things. Uh, next generation, teletext, Minitel for want of better proxies, obviously not as well known to America, but very well known here. And thinking, well, why would the internet not transform it. And then what you had is people, I always remember an interesting case study where I was, worked for cable and wireless early on on um, voice over IP technology. And cable and wireless would say, oh, this will never take off. This was pre-Skype, right? And because they had some techie who could say why it wouldn't happen. So, and it was the same thing with the, I remember the travel industry giants, what was so wonderful with hindsight is to see the big guys who ran the big package tour operators explain why no one would ever buy travel you online. You went against those guys. Oh, we went hard against them. Thomas I mean, Cook. I mean, I thought they should have all been fired. I think they weren't <laughs> fired early enough, the people running those businesses. Uh, that, I mean, yeah. why were those people still in post? Well, they when they were totally they could, in yeah, denial of the internet. Totally in denial. Happening. And their inability to understand how the industry was changing. Oh, that was your end. That was your <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> You're like going right in there. Right? Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and who were some of your models at the time? Was there, like, Travelocity was around, I guess? Or, uh, yeah, I mean, look, uh, who was around? Travelocity, Expedia were around. I think we were pretty, con you know, we, we were maybe a year or two after some of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was sort of 96, 95 for Travelocity, right? We were 97 when we wrote the business plan. But I think one of the key differentiators, obviously, is we were trying to do something truly different. One of the reasons why we captured a lot of attention in Zeitgeist Mood is we weren't trying to say we're just going to copy an Expedia or something else, we said, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> we are going to reinvent a model for consumer behavior, which is cutting time dimension, and whether you are going away, going out, or staying in at the last minute, you, we will serve you. Were you, you. you one of the first to kind of phrase that last minute? Uh, no, look, I, I technically, last minute, uh, it was a German legal term, mm -hmm. it still is, I think, and you couldn't sell travel outside of a two-week window legally in Germany because last minute was actually a word that they had adopted and put into <coughs> a legal definition. Um, so we would not claim to be the first to do that. But their definition of last minute was a strict 
basically package tour, unsold inventory. And what did they mean by last minute? I mean, not exactly. Uh, uh, unsold inventory sold within two weeks. Within maybe. two weeks. A okay. discounted window for that. Mm -hmm. And the, the French had it with De Grief Tour, who are one of the pioneers. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, De Grief here meaning, for those that don't know, unbranded. Buy them eventually? We bought De Grief Tour. It was a Minitel business. It was actually when we bought them, it was the largest e-commerce business in Europe. Mm -hmm. So we are actually right. running the largest e-commerce right. business in Europe once we ran that. But our definition of last minute was much more exciting and broader and it encompassed all of the things that have happened today. So, mm -hmm. you know, we had restaurant food delivery, we had millions of people buying theater tickets, cinema tickets, we'd package up leisure, we'd package theater plus restaurants. Mm -hmm. We would obviously, we did restaurant food delivery um, before anyone else did it so pretty you, much. So 20 years ago, you were doing activities, which is yeah. now the big hot thing. Yeah, experiences, the, the next, all that. Yeah, we did that. Next yeah, big exactly. Thing, yeah. 20 years yeah. ago, um, ground transportation. Mm -hmm. And, and, and basically other retailing, like yeah. other types of ancillaries, and you kind of packaged it in with your air, car, ho and hotel. Yeah, and we did location-based discounts on your WAP phones, mm -hmm. so you would have a, you would walk out of here and then get discounts on your mobile phone based on where you were. Still doesn't happen properly. You know, personalize them. What mobile phones <clears throat> look like then? <laughs> yeah, it was that. That was that was why it didn't work very well. It was that, that screen that size on a WAP phone with, with very limited data. There was like 300 baud and. Yeah, and exactly. So it was sort of, yeah. uh, it, it was fine. And then we did voice recognition in 2001 or two, so you could talk to our database and book a hotel through us. Okay. Um, so we were we were early to a lot of things. So for those of you, uh, you know, I don't know who follow, didn't follow the whole trajectory. So basically. Uh, when, Brent and Martha Lane Fox are the founders. So founded the company in uh, 98, uh, uh, raised capital, went public in 2000, and sold in 05? Oh, yeah. oh, so in a course of seven years, founded yeah. the company, sold it to Sabre. Now, what was that ride like for you personally? It was seven, it was a, it was a sort of business career, a lifetime's business career in, in one short space. Mm -hmm. um, because we were the fastest company in Europe ever to go public from launch. We were the most oversubscribed. We were the share price down by some of the What were your revenues the at the time? Uh, the revenues were that of like, a couple of million when we were worth 400 million or something. Uh, and so, Profits? Or uh, uh, and losing at least 25 million pounds a year, which uh, we were right mm -hmm. about. Um, <laughs> you know, a lot of people again said, why are you losing all this money? What are you doing? And we're like, we're trying, you know, as my father used to tell me then, the guy who runs a local shoe shop, nothing wrong with that, he's profitable. Mm -hmm. you know, you're trying to do something different. We were trying to build a barrier mm -hmm. and a business that had a competitive moat, mm -hmm. and that meant convincing people that we could see the future and execute, being able to raise money to build that moat, to build a technology platform that could, could, could compete with the Americans as they entered Europe, and then to build one of the best e-commerce brands in Europe. And you continued, even though there was the dot-com bust after you went yeah. public, you still continued to buy like what, 14 companies? Yeah, we bought 14 and I was just at bookings with uh, Olivier earlier and saying, regrettably, the one that would have been 15th would have been bookings because we saw it at that time, but uh, I was, we, yeah. we bought too many. I was going to uh, ask, uh, that was one of my questions, but there wasn't Priceline an investor in last minute? You're absolutely right, and I did tell the anecdote quickly <laughs> earlier, but the anecdote of why Priceline was an investor, or one of the reasons was, um, I was a cheeky entrepreneur and bought Priceline.co.uk, the domain name, in 1997. Um, so they had to come and talk to me. <laughs> and I had a very friendly conversation. I'm not a domain squatter, but I'm sure there's stuff we can do together. Um, here's the domain name. What are you going to do for me? <coughs> um, so um, you brought up bookings. So I'm going to ask, are you surprised at where they are today? Like how the industry is today, you know, with booking being yeah. so dominant, Expedia being the, the big number two in Europe, the, you know, the, the big number one in the US? Yeah, look, what and, and just, just to cut you for a second, yeah. and one of the comments I'd made yesterday, so 70% of the OTA gross bookings is now those two brands yeah. in Europe. Yeah, no, I get their absolute dominance and scale. Mm -hmm. What There's two things. One, clearly what they've done brilliantly is operational excellence. And that bookings model of the commission bidding by the, by the, by the hotels was something I tried to get Travelocity to change to after I sold it to them. Mm -hmm. I said the minute I had the first meeting afterwards, I'm like, sorry guys, there's a better business model. We need to adapt the way we deal with hotels and do it like bookings, because I can't see how our model, it's much better. You know, the margins end up being the same. We do a lot more work. We have less inventory. Therefore, we do less well on PPC and SEO. It was all pretty obvious even then. Um, so <clears throat> in that sense, I'm, I'm surprised that the incumbent's dilemma meant more people didn't adapt to it. That's partly to do with people being too short-termist, mm -hmm. because it would have meant our margins would have gone down probably for a couple of quarters. History says, should have done that. Um, uh, 
Similarly with Expedia, I think there is again great operational execution with a very proficient technology platform and a good single brand. Uh, uh, and, but the bits that both of them, I, would, I am hugely disappointed in the travel industry as a whole for the lack of innovation that's happened since. If you take up my slides, if we had one from 2000, when I spoke about personalization and understanding the consumer and what are we doing for the customer. What has happened since then? It's, it's shocking. What's happened since then is those pipe dreams that I put out mm -hmm. should be realized because then it was very hard to do because actually the data, you didn't have enough data, you didn't have machine yeah. learning, um, yeah. personalization you didn't have, Amazon were the only people doing some level of collaborative filtering, et cetera. Today, there are, there are no, no excuse. excuses. Thank you. There are no excuses. And it's amazing that I don't know what it is. I think it's partly, again, the incumbent's dilemma. It's partly not enough people in this industry putting the customer first, mm -hmm. understanding the customer journey and going back to those first principles. And also, partly they're making so much, they're doing so well anyway. That's what I mean by incumbent's dilemma. Look, these so are, are amazing businesses, these incumbents. So are you talking about, kind of, so you're talking about the incumbents. So that maybe they're not being innovative mm. enough, but do you feel like there's enough startups, and you know, we can move over to, to kind of you know, yeah. what you're doing now, because do you feel like there's enough startups out there with the great ideas that, that just need to be better funded to make these ideas happen? Because maybe the incumbents, like you said, are a little more concerned about shareholders and, and sure, short term, yeah, and, and risk taking, it's, it's very hard to take risk. Right. The, 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 the couple that I have backed in this space, I haven't done as much in travel recently, we can, we can talk about it later, but I was, I think, the, one of the first people to say yes to Get Your Guide and Johannes Reck. Oh, yeah. So, obviously, that's mm. been a huge success. Um, again, I think that is a lot about just smarts and operational excellence, mm. again, on, on that experience side, as you say, and attractions. Um, we, we were also some of the first money in to get uh, One Fine Stay. Um, which is also differentiated on, on, on that model. And then I was an advisor to some ex .com people that did uh, Love Holidays, which is a sort of unsung sort of, uh, I don't know if the number's public, but multi-hundred million pound exit uh, to private equity, uh, doing just excellence in technology and backbone. But we have seen people try, lots of people do the, at events like this, you will get a lot of people doing the trip management layer, mm -hmm. doing the inspiration layer, um, and uh, you know, yes, it's still surprising that less have broken through, and I may be missing some, but I think it's that they're still lacking data access uh, a bit. And is this a, an issue you see kind of globally, or do you see this even being more so in Europe? Is there, is there enough funding startups in Europe is because you know when we look at some of the CAD and when we look at some of the way that the funding dollars have been spread out over the years we you know obviously so much now has been going toward Asia and um, you know Europe and the and the orange there has not been getting its share of startup funding dollars. Now that's across all categories is it or just travel? Uh, all travel. Oh, travel. just travel mm -hmm. sorry yeah it's just travel. Yes. Um, yes. I, I think partly is the reciprocal of that actually when you see Europe's share of funding mm -hmm. across the whole of technology, mm -hmm. we're actually doing pretty well now. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And I think that's also, it's a question of where are the margins and where is the talent going to? You know, is it health tech or ed tech or, you know, some of these other, other big areas? And I think it also is, to your point, it's the dominance of some of the existing players that will put off savvy entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So that could be an issue in travel. So could we talk a little bit about um, what you're doing now, obviously, found, yeah. well, one of the many things you're doing. But let's talk about Founders Factory and your Founders Forum, mm -hmm. and because um, that is what more of a corporate-backed incubator. Yeah. So one of the reasons why I'm excited to be here is we are doing uh, on online travel again. Uh, we have at Founders Factory, which is a multi-sector corporate-backed incubator and accelerator, backed by the likes of L'Oreal, Aviva, Macmillan, uh, EasyJet. There you go. Thank you. Uh, Marks and Spencers. So within travel in particular, what we do, what this means is what we do on behalf of those companies. So we have 70 full-time rock star employees who help the startups and the entrepreneurs that we accelerate or incubate. So we do five accelerator companies within travel and we launch two new ones a year. 
And I don't know if we want to go on to the two we're launching now, but uh, one that's getting a lot of attention is trying to change the way people buy travel, BRB, Be Right Back, millennial subscription service um, where people spend 50 pounds a month to contribute to those travel holidays. Um, and that's actually getting some really good early traction. And then the other one, which is another one of these sectors that still hasn't been disrupted in travel, is going after the GDS, uh, the people oh, which, who bought us, uh -huh. uh, Kite, K-Y-T-E, um, saying, why have the GDS has still got this lock? 20 years on since everybody talked about how expensive they were, what legacy technologies they are, um, surely now is the moment where it's easier to do that. So we are, we are going for that, going for that. And yeah, the, this one is Lucky Trip, which I think is here today, uh, which again has got onto the EasyJet homepage and is doing that spontaneous travel inspiration stuff that we talked a bit about. So innovating really at a great UI layer there. So have you, you have a travel vertical, because you kind of left travel for a while, right? When you went to made.com and whatnot. And then as you're investing, is, is the travel vertical, do you see that expanding in your portfolio? And, and interesting yeah. companies certainly. Well, look, certainly get your guides made me excited again. Because okay. when, you, when you invest in seed at a company that's a billion dollar plus mm -hmm. business, you're like, OK. That was a good one. That, that, yeah. that's, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. they're, they're still there. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at, so yeah, this is some of our travel portfolio. Mm -hmm. When you look at what can still be done with data in travel, it's exciting. You still look at, I actually did Easy Car with Stelios, which didn't, you know, which, which I wanted it to be the P2P, the drivey, obviously, has had big exits. You know, we didn't, Stelios was, I think, I have to be careful, it's public, but re re reluctant to invest enough in that P2P angle. The business did very well, but we probably underinvested in the, in the, in the ride sharing element of it, but obviously that's a, you know, that is obviously clearly a mega trend in travel that we haven't talked about is yeah. ride sharing. And, you know, yeah, we've, you know, we've got into that. I've got into that in various ways, for example, doing autonomous driving technologies that have been bought by the Ubers and Lyfts of this mm -hmm. world. So that's another way to play that. Right. Um, sure. And I think the mobility, obviously you've got the um, the, the players that are doing data with smart mobility, smart cities. So I think smart cities is another really exciting area of travel. Mm -hmm. So robotics seems to be something you're interested yeah. in, right? And, you're, yeah. just, and you're, you're working with robotics in restaurants and whatnot, the food industry. So for travel, you think about hospitality, cruise lines, all the applications for robotics. Yeah. What, can you talk about what you foresee there? Yeah, so obviously one of the best cases of robotics, which is already happening, is you have robot bartenders on cruise ships. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that exists. Uh, is that a good thing? Great thing. It's a fantastic thing. It's it's entertaining. It's fun, and it's more efficient, and you know, and and they they work very well. We are trying to go several steps further, of course. Uh, so we announced last week that one of our startups out of Founders Factory is called Kara Curry. That's with K's, uh, and that is a robot robots to do food preparation. The cornerstone investor, apart from First Minute Capital, my seed venture fund, and Founders Factory, is Acado, the ten billion pound online grocery business that are the world leaders in robotics actually in the warehouses. So they've backed that because they believe, like us, that robots will do food preparation to a level of personalization that will help customers get a better experience, save money, reduce food wastage. And then the next step for us is to go to consumer-facing restaurants um, that will entertain, that will serve customers, do, do food preparation, and entertain customers with robots. So I, what else, when you put on your, your vision glasses, your crystal ball, do you see happening? That's related in technology and where you see application in travel. In applications in travel, look, I, th I, th I still, again, the other one that I wanted to do more of is virtual reality augmented reality. Mm -hmm. So we haven't probably spoken enough about those. So again, 15 years ago, I was thinking we should build, sorry, maybe people are already doing it, I'm not sure they are, but I wanted to build a game where you would go to your holiday destination in virtual reality before you'd go and really see it in a sort of very real it's not way. not much happening, in, right? No. We thought we'd see a lot more happening in virtual yeah, reality. Yeah, I think it has. I mean, yeah. but again, devices are getting better, and it's, it's the why now moment. Mm -hmm. Are we coming to that? But I think more exciting probably is augmented reality mm -hmm. and where that is happening. With, so I think we will see more travel plays in, in augmented reality. The question is, again, 
how do startups get in there versus some of the bigger giants? And then I think it's just, can you build enough credibility? If, it if it's very capital intensive, can you build enough credibility to get the capital? And I'll go back to our robots thing as an example where we built this super credible team that we can raise a huge seed round for. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll raise a ton more money soon for that because it is capital intensive. So I think if you're going to go after AR or VR, it may be that you got to look, you need to build capital out for five years. Okay, so we're out of time, but just final words for the audience, you know, what, to raise capital, what, what do you say the top three things are? Credibility, so build amazing teams, get amazing advisory boards, sh show you can get the best people in the world onto your team mm -hmm. uh, and go after okay. huge markets and think of that use of fun slide and that why now slide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Great. Ladies thank and you. gentlemen, Brent Hoberman.